The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Back in the 1930s, an unknown company introduced a low-frequency audio oscillator. To control its gain stability, the clever engineers used an incandescent light bulb. Even though it was their first product, they named it the 200A to look more established. The names of those engineers and that company were Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. Hello and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. I'm your host, James Lewis. On this show, we talk about the equipment found on your electronics workbench. This episode continues our series on instrument basics with function generators. You might also hear these called waveform, signal, or arbitrary generators. Just like Bill and Dave's oscillator from 1938, these instruments output signals with various amplitudes and frequencies. Unlike the 200A, modern function generators can output wave shapes like sine, square, and triangles. Engineers use them to act as a circuit's clock, test filter designs, characterize op-amp circuits, and a bunch of other things. So, let's take a look at what a function generator is and how you use one. You might remember using graphing calculators in geometry class to draw algebraic functions like y equals sine of x. And if you do not remember, here is my graphing calculator drawing that math function. This simple equation creates the most basic signal type used in electronics, the sine wave. All signals are fundamentally made up of sine waves. So if we go back and add a few more terms to our equation, that sine wave turns into a square wave. These instruments get called function generators because math generates their output. There are two basic types of generators, analog and digital. Analog generators use analog circuits like op-amps to generate their outputs. If a generator has knobs and push buttons, it is probably analog. Digital generators are basically high-speed digital to analog converters. They use a technique called direct digital synthesis or DDS. By sending them digital data, they can generate sine waves or virtually any waveform. By the way, I am throwing around the terms function generator and waveform generator. While they do have specific meanings, today I see them used arbitrarily because most generators are DDS-based arbitrary waveform generators or AWGs. Okay, let's go see what an actual waveform looks like. Here, I have my function generator hooked up to a Multicomp Pro USB-based scope. We'll use this to look at the different waveform types, like sine wave, square wave, and triangle. The sine wave is the most basic waveform, and it is usually the fastest the generator can output. This one is great for testing filter designs. Square waves might also be called rectangle or pulse. These are used to clock digital circuits. Ramp, triangle, and sawtooth are all pretty much the same, and these are the kind of waveforms that an op-amp integrator might make. In addition to these basic types, a generator like this one might also have other modes like noise and arbitrary. If it has these, it is very likely a DDS-based generator. Okay, next, let's talk about going from left to right. Frequency might be the most important setting for a generator. Older generators have a physical knob to change frequency, while modern generators let you type it in. Sometimes living in the future is pretty cool. Let's start with a 1 MHz sine wave. On the scope, there is no signal. That's because generators default with their output being off, so we have to enable the output control. Now watch what happens to the waveform as I change the frequency from 1 MHz to 2 MHz and then up to 5 MHz. By changing the signal to a square wave, notice how it looks a little bit more like a distorted sine wave now. By slowing the generator down to 500 kHz and zooming the scope out a little bit, the signal looks more square. And that is because all waveforms are derived from sine waves. Only the sine function supports the fastest output frequency. All of the other functions are bandwidth limited and so that means you need to operate them at lower frequencies. So keep that in mind when selecting or using a function generator. 
Okay, let's look at two more parameters. The square wave supports a duty cycle control. It defines how long a square wave is on or off. As I adjust down to 20% or up to 80%, notice how the duty cycle changes, but the frequency stays the same. It is just like the analog right on an Arduino. Sine waves do not have a duty cycle, however, they do have a phase adjustment. Although that really only makes sense when you're using an input reference, which I've never actually done. Anyway, let's move on to the up and down. Let's set this triangle wave to 200 millivolts peak to peak. Look at what the scope measures though. It says 400 millivolts peak to peak. So what gives? Why is there a difference between these two? Well, it comes down to impedance. For the purposes of this discussion, that's basically the same as resistance. The generator expects to drive a certain impedance and our scope presents a certain impedance. This particular scope has a one mega ohm impedance, but the generator is set to drive 50 ohms. If they were matched, the output would be correct. Now, if you're not sure what to set your generator's impedance to, make sure it is set to high. With that, a 200 millivolt peak to peak amplitude looks correct on the scope. Okay, now as I increase the output to 800 millivolts peak to peak, the waveform's amplitude also increases. Here's something else to realize. This marker is the zero point for the waveform. So this signal is going up to 400 millivolts, but down to negative 400 millivolts. If you put that signal into an Arduino's analog input, you're going to have a bad time. By adding 400 millivolts or half the peak to peak value, the waveform shifts up above zero volts. Let me readjust the scope real quick. The peak to peak value is about the same, but now the max and min have changed to about 800 millivolts and basically zero volts. When setting the output voltage, always keep in mind where you want the max and min to go. In addition to the basic waveform controls, there are a couple of advanced features you can enable. Some generators support sweeping and modulation. Here, I have set the start to 500 kilohertz, the stop to two megahertz, and the sweep time to 2.5 seconds. On the scope, you can see how the frequency increases and then it starts over. Modulation simulates signals like AM or FM radio signals, at least at lower frequencies. If I set the generator to apply an FM modulation, the signal looks bouncy on the scope. Personally, I think turning on persistence shows the frequency change even better. So at this point, you might want me to explain when you would use these more advanced functions. And I guess you could use the sweep time when characterizing a filter. And if you're building an envelope detector, you could use the modulation. But to be frank, on an entry level benchtop generator, I rarely use those features except to make interesting displays on my scope for use in the backgrounds of my videos. With high end RF signal generators, that is a totally different case, but that would be a totally different video. Now, if you have a way you're using modulation or sweep, then head over to Element 14 and let me know what you're doing. Maybe it's something we can cover more in depth in a future video. For now, let's talk about different generator form factors. To be upfront, I do not usually recommend a bench style unless you have a specific need for one. Instead, I would look for instruments that offer the capability built in. For example, most bench scopes have an arbitrary waveform generator. In fact, I could have done this entire video with my bench scope because it has a generator built in. And it does most of what the standalone generator does. So when buying a new scope, I recommend looking for one that already has the generator. One more option are these all-in-one instruments like the Analog Discovery 2. This has function generation capability as well. If the integrated options do not work for you, then one like this multi-comp is a good option. Look for something that has multiple functions and supports modulations and sweeps. Just make sure its frequency is fast enough for your application. All right, let's wrap up. There are three controls you need to remember when using a function generator. The waveform type, the frequency, and the amplitude. When selecting the amplitude, remember that the generator defaults to swinging around zero volts 
so you probably need to add an offset. Oh, and don't forget to turn the generator output on. Over on element14.com slash workbenchwednesdays, we post-it notes for this episode, which includes links like application notes related to function generators and a link to this Multicomp Pro generator. By the way, that's the best place to ask me questions because I'm much more likely to see them. For now, it is time for me to get back to arbitrarily generating waveforms on my electronics workbench. <laughs>